All right, good morning. Welcome. Happy Monday. Hope you had a great weekend. Uh, we're going to continue talking about chapter 14, uh, part one, which is our introduction to acids and bases. And we haven't talked about acids and bases very much yet, uh, even though it's a hallmark of chemistry, because we haven't talked about equilibrium until this point. But now that we have, oh yeah. Uh, as a reminder, this Friday at 1.10, uh, when you come to lab, we'll talk about problem set number one. We'll take quiz number one, which you'll have questions from problem set one. Uh, you'll turn in the lab we did on Friday, the idea of the unknown compound lab, if you haven't done so already. We'll start the determination of an equilibrium constant lab. I just called it DET. AEQ, because I was a lazy chemist, but anyway, make sure that you bring a printed copy for that. That's a lab that the experiment doesn't take too long, but uh, processing the data will take a little bit of time. So just FYI, lots of examples and stuff. And then also by this Friday at nine o'clock, if you haven't done so, make sure you reserve a class presentation topic with me. That can be literally as easy as just sending me an email saying, hey, I would like to do this. Give me an alternate or two, just in case something's been taken. I can pick a compound a topic for you if you'd like, um, but it should be pretty easy. Any questions, any of that stuff? We left off on Friday talking about the five strong acids, all right? Acids always, uh, well, excuse me, acids should, I think, and most of the time do, have a hydrogen listed first if they are a truly an acid. So uh, when you see an acid with, or an acid, uh, the first hydrogen or hydrogens will be the acidic ones and the other ones will not. Now, these five are really important to your future. There's not that many strong acids, all right? And I want you to know slash memorize slash put on your sheet of notes, which you can bring with you to the quiz this Friday, by the way. You'll staple it to the back when you turn in the quiz. But anyway, write these down. Make sure you know them, all right? Uh, as we talked about on Friday, there's thousands and thousands of weak acids, but there's not that many strong acids. So in Chem 223, if I list one of these, I want you to know it's a strong acid, and basically every other acid will be weak, and that'll be important to what's coming up. Now, in a strong acid, we're not using equilibrium. It's a one-way arrow, all right? And that just says that, hey, this is totally going 100% to products. So you put a mole of HCl in, you're going to get a mole of hydronium and chloride once it reacts with water. No equilibrium for us, no going back to reactants. That's what a strong acid is. It puts it in the opposite direction. I showed you briefly this cheesy uh, picture one of my students sent me. Uh, HCl, all right, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> fantasy license plates and stuff, so. Anyway, now, five strong acids, thousands and thousands of weak acids, and there's no way that you should even begin to like think about memorizing them, because there's so many of them. Um, one of the best known weak acids is acetic acid. Acetic acid is basically the active ingredient in vinegar. So if you put vinegar on a salad or something like that, Woohoo, acids. Anyway, um, acetic acid has been a troublemaker for us since Chem 221, and you can hopefully see why. Acetic acid has a methyl group, CH3. It has a C double bond O, we called it a carbonyl in the organic chemistry, and also an OH. This whole part right here is like a carboxylic acid. Only this hydrogen is acidic, all right? So this is an example of a compound that has other hydrogens, but they're not acidic hydrogens, all right? Those are just regular hydrogens. So we haven't in, since Chem 221, it's been so difficult to write. Now, sometimes people will write H, CH3, CH2, CO2. Sometimes it's written CH3, CO2, H, and there's all different variations. A lot of times though, because to get the roundness, people will write acetic acid as HOAC and the OAC minus is nothing more than the acetate ion which was one of the first polyatomic ions that was a little weird back in chem 221. Anyway, acetic acid, like all the thousands upon thousands of weak acids, also reacts with water like HCl and the other ones. It also makes hydronium 
this minus h plus is left over, all right? But the difference is these now truly are equilibrium. So the reactants will not go 100% to the products. And acetic acid is an example where roughly one out of 10,000 molecules will go to the product side and the other roughly 9,999 or so will stay on the reactant side. So strong acids, one-sided arrow, reactants, 100% to products, good to go. But all the weak acids will be in equilibrium. So you'll have some reactant, some product. You'll probably have more reactant than you'll have product. We'll talk about that later. Um, and if you do see this HOAC thing, that's just a common abbreviation for whatever reason for acetic acid. Any questions on that? Now, bases are very similar, all right? There's strong bases and there's weak bases. Now, bases are sources of hydroxide. And there are essentially three strong monobasic bases, three bases that I'd like you to know that would have, but are really important. Sodium hydroxide, by far the most common one. If you use Drano in drains in your house, you're basically using a sodium hydroxide source. Um, potassium hydroxide and lithium hydroxide are also somewhat common strong bases. So just like there were five strong acids, there's three strong bases, and those are all really good things to know. Um, there are other strong bases and strong acids. Calcium hydroxide is actually a strong system. So calcium hydroxide is an example of what they call a dibasic system, and that's because it creates two hydroxides for every mole you go into. Most of what we're gonna talk about in Chem 223 will be monobasic, i.e. one hydroxide, or monoacids, like one H+. But you can have dibasic, even tribasic systems. You can also have diacidic systems and stuff like that. Uh, ammonia is by far the most common weak base. So just like weak acids, we start thinking about equilibrium. All the weak bases, we need to think about that too. Um, this statement here, not 100% ionized, that means it doesn't go to completion. If you put a mole of ammonia in, you don't have a mole of products. Um, ammonia, if you remember from Chem 222, is tetrahedral, trigonal pyramid, all that kind of jazz. And that lone pair on there is able to take a hydrogen off water. So notice that if a base is a hydroxide creator, I mean, ammonia doesn't even have any oxygen. So initially, it doesn't feel like a base. But when you put ammonia in water, it's able to pull hydrogen off and make some hydroxide, which makes Ammonia it acts as a base in solution by accepting a proton from a water molecule. This liberates a hydroxide ion and results in a basic solution. As a quick reminder, ammonium is NH4 plus and ammonia is NH3. Now again, all the weak bases, like the weak acids, will be in equilibrium. The weak acids created hydronium, the weak bases create hydroxide. And if you're not certain if something is an acid or a base, this is what you look for. If there's hydroxide, it's gonna be a base. On the other hand, if it's hydronium, it's gonna be an acid. And these are in equilibrium, so you don't have 100% completion. Bronsted and Lowry were two scientists working apparently independently of each other. And they came up with an idea that's still used a lot for describing acids and bases. Um, most of the time, people refer to this just as the Bronsted theory. I think they like writing the O with the line through it. I don't know. But anyway, but Lowry apparently was also a person that helped contribute. And they kind of published it different times, but the one guy was earlier. Doesn't matter. Officially, it's the Bronsted Lowry theory. By the way, there are three acid base theories. One of them's not used, and one of them we'll talk about at the end of this chapter. But the Bronsted theory is the main theory that scientists use. And in the Bronsted Lowry theory, acids donate an H plus ion, and bases accept an H plus ion. All right? 
And that's kind of the overall idea. <clears throat> Now, earlier I said how a base is a hydroxide generator. I didn't say anything about accepting H plus ions or whatever. But we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But when it comes right down to it, under the Bronsted Lowry theory, acids give up an H plus and bases take the H plus in. Um, let's go back to that ammonia example to see how this works out. Now here's ammonia, NH3, and it's reacting with water. And a base is something that accepts an H plus ion. So in this definition then, if we look at this, the ammonia is going to be accepting an H plus from water. So that means that ammonia is a base. But the other side of this is that water is not an innocent bystander because water is going to be donating, excuse me, an H plus to the ammonia to make ammonia. So an acid is a hydrogen creator. It donates a hydrogen. So in this process, NH3 taking an H plus from water, this is a true acid-base interaction. Ammonia acts as a base in solution by accepting a proton from a water molecule. This liberates a hydroxide ion and results in a basic solution. So the ammonia is taking an H plus from water. It's accepting the H plus. It's a base. And the source of the H plus was the water. So the water is donating an H plus. Water here is an acid. But, and I hope you're all sitting down, and Claire, you're still getting yourself situated, so it's okay, you can stand. No, 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 you're cool, it's all right. But the rest of you are all sitting down, because I'm gonna blow your mind a little bit, all right? Equilibrium, back and forth. If you remember that in equilibrium, products are also going back to reactants. Notice what happens here. If ammonium and hydroxide work together, ammonium is going to be donating an H plus to the hydroxide. So ammonium is an acid unto itself. And if you think about hydroxide going to the left, making products on the left-hand side, hydroxide is creating, is accepting an H plus from the ammonium. So hydroxide is acting as a base. So what I want you to see here is that ammonia, a base, creates ammonium, an acid. And the water, which here is acting as an acid, giving up H plus to NH3, the acid creates the base hydroxide, all right? This is kind of like a wild dance where the base creates an acid and an acid creates the base. But these two react to create the acid back and the base back. It's a thing that goes back and forth all the time when you think about this acid-base theory. Uh, here's the ammonium, here's the water, ammonium, hydroxide. And again, what's really wild is that ammonia, a base, creates ammonium, an acid. So bases create acids, and the acid here is creating a base. When you have a group like this that's related by an H+, plus, either gaining or losing it, they call it a conjugate pair. So in my world, if ammonia is a base, ammonium would be the conjugate acid. And water here is acting as an acid. Water creates a conjugate base hydroxide. So conjugates are related by H+, either gaining or losing, all right? Even though ammonia is a base and um, hydroxide is a base, there's no connection there because you can't add or subtract an H+, from either of those to make the other species, all right? But ammonia, ammonium, definitely conjugates. Water and hydroxide also conjugates. Cool. So in this acid-base theory, every acid reacts with a base. The acid makes a new base. The acid base creates a new acid, all right? And those acids and bases can interact to create the opposites again. This is the weird part about equilibrium. 
but all you need to know is that I, I talk about conjugates, all right? Conjugates are just an acid and a base that are related by an H plus. You can gain or lose. We'll talk about that later. Cool. It's more than just ammonia though. Now hydrogen carbonate is another type of an acid. Now hydrogen carbonate is not HCl, HBr, HI, HNO3, or perchloric acid. So it's a weak acid. It's going to be in equilibrium. And again, you know it's equilibrium because of the two-sided arrow. Well, hydrogen carbonate reacts with water and it ends up making, in these conditions, hydronium because this is an acid. Acids create hydronium, creates hydronium and carbonate, all right? So a couple of things about this, all right? We've got a conjugate pair with the hydrogen carbonate and the carbonate. So you add an H plus to carbonate, you make hydrogen carbonate. You take away an H plus from hydrogen carbonate and you take the carbonate. We also have a second conjugate pair. Water here is a base interacting with hydronium. So you add H plus to water, you make hydronium. Take an H plus away from hydronium, you make water. And if I was just to show you this reaction, if you see hydronium as a product, that means that it's some kind of an acid you're dealing with, okay? If you saw hydroxide, then you'd know it was a base. Questions? All right. Well, another weird thing about this is that in this example, water is acting like a base, all right? It's taking the H plus from an acid to make hydronium. But in the last example with ammonia, a water was acting like an acid. It was giving up an H plus to ammonia to make ammonium, and hydroxide was created. So we're gonna see that some compounds, they can be acids or bases. They're not restricted to just one type, if you will. So this is the kind of question you might run into, and it just says, which of the following is not an acid-base conjugate pair, okay? And the question is here, yeah, which of these uh, is not related by an H plus being added or subtracted? So let's start from the bottom down here. This is nitric acid, and this is nitrate. And hopefully you can see that if you add an H plus to nitrate, you'll make HNO3. But if you take away an H plus from HNO3, you'll make NO3 minus. So those are conjugates of each other. They're related by an H plus. And the same thing here, this is carbonic acid and hydrogen carbonate. Take away an H plus here, you make hydrogen carbonate. Add an H plus here, you make carbonic acid. So of these three that are left, which one then is not a conjugate? B is actually a conjugate pair too cheap. Um, like you can add H plus to fluoride and make hydrofluoric acid. And if you take away an H plus from hydrofluoric acid, you'll make fluoride. Fluoride in water is a big thing. I'm more in favor of it than not, but I will say that fluoride is different than the other ones because it does have some basic properties. But anyway, so it's not B, all right, because those two are related. Which one doesn't have this plus or minus H plus thing going on? A. A. Now this little oxygen right there is not present on the other species, all right? So these are actually two different species. If you took an H plus away from HClO, which is hypochlorous acid, you would make the hypochlorite ion, ClO minus. And ClO minus plus H plus would make HClO. But Cl minus is the conjugate of HCl. So HCl minus an H plus would make chloride and chloride plus an H plus would make HCl. So all you wanna do is just literally look and just make sure that it's more than an H, which is missing on both sides. And that little fascist oxygen right there was enough to mess us up, so cool. Questions? So the product for A <clears throat> creates a hydroxide, OH, right? Or no? Uh, 
shouldn't, I shouldn't worry about the oxidants, what you're saying. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, if it's a conjugate Clifford, here's what we can say, all right? You'll either take away or add an H+, <clears throat> all right? Now, adding an H+, to a neutral species would be tough because <laughs> uh, you don't usually have just H+, but you could take it away. So you'd have ClO minus left over, all right? Mm -hmm. And you could add an H plus to this one, all right, which would make it HCl, but um, HCl is not HClO, <clears throat> and ClO minus is not Cl minus, so that's kind of the idea. I see it. Yeah, great. Excellent question. Other questions? All right. Without the addition of any other substances, two water molecules can interact with each other to produce a hydronium ion and a hydroxide ion by transfer of a proton from one water molecule to another. This process is called autoionization. Water with ammonia was an acid. Water with hydrogen carbonate was a base. And this is a normal process for certain types of compounds. And as some of you have seen since, in this, if you've been with me since Chem 221, I'm always trying to point out the weird things that water does. This is another one that's pretty unique. Water can either be an acid or a base. It undergoes a little bit anyway of what's called autoionization. So most water just sits there, H2O, totally happy. But some water reacts with another water molecule and they make hydronium and hydroxide, all right? And so if you're drinking water, all right, Claire, I'm gonna pick on you since you have a drink thing there. Let's say it's filled with water. You know, Claire's like, oh my gosh, there's acid and base in my water. And it's totally normal. It's a pretty small amount of stuff, but it is something to think about, all right? Water has both acid and base within it all the time, thanks to this auto ionization process. So some waters interact with each other and they make hydronium and hydroxide. And it feels weird maybe to start thinking about how, oh, don't wanna drink acid, you know, but there's so little as we're gonna see acid and base in the water, our bodies are totally normal and used to it. Remember most of our foods and stuff and drinks that we eat and drink are acidic anyway. So uh, our bodies are used to a certain amount of acid and base. So water is, again, an amazing substance. It has a high heat capacity, uh, hydrogen bonds, we'll see. It does other kind of cool things. We'll talk about this term. Water is an amazing substance, but for us right now, water is a wonderful solvent because it does have auto ionization. So you'll have some H3O plus hydronium and some hydroxide present at any temperature, any normal liquid temperature, I think. Yeah. Hydroxide is just that's right. Uh, try to write it if you, well, officially the negative is on the oxygen. Most of the Tai Chi people will write it um, OH, but if you write HO, it's cool too. Stuff. Yeah, good, 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 good. So people have studied this auto-ionization. It's really important for the stuff we're gonna start talking about. <clears throat> auto-ionization has a temperature dependence, all right? And so at 25 degrees Celsius, which is generally seen as a room temperature, okay? The K value, the equilibrium constant has been determined. 1.00 times 10 to the minus 14. Now, let's put our equilibrium hats back on. The value of this K tells us something about reactant or product favor. Knowing this number, are we gonna have more reactant, pure water, or are we gonna have more product, hydronium and hydroxide? Reactant. Reactant, good, that's right. If K is less than one, all right, you're gonna have a lot more reactant around than product. And this is a very small K, all right? You don't have a lot of hydronium and hydroxide floating around in your water. A little bit, definitely, but it's not a lot, all right? So that's why it doesn't sting or anything when you drink it down. Um, anyway, uh, K is temperature dependent. We'll talk about the implications of that in a little bit too. But running with this idea then, that at room temperature, K is 10 to the minus 14, we can really think about what it means for a solution to be neutral. 
Now, <clears throat> K is going to come from two waters. It makes one hydroxide and one hydronium. So if it's a neutral solution, the hydronium and the hydroxide will be the same value. <clears throat> So you can literally set then your Kw, which in 25 degrees is this number, equal to the hydronium squared, because it's hydronium and hydroxide are the same, x times x. So it's also equal to the hydroxide squared. <clears throat> so if you take the square root of K, you get 1.00 times 10 to the minus 7. And that is the literal moles per liter of the acid and base present in your water at any one time. Now, earlier we predicted that because this was so reactant favored that this, the amount of acid and base was gonna be small, not a lot of products. And you can see it's a very small number. Like in the labs, we usually use concentrations between roughly 10 to the minus three and 10 to the minus one, all right? Uh, in the lab we did on Friday, the numbers I think were 0.1, 10 to the minus one. So this is many orders of magnitude less than that. It's not a huge value. Uh, we will be using this value a lot, all right? So no slash memorize slash put on your sheet of notes the KW value. It will help you out as we go through. So this one E negative seven value is like the same for every, it's only for water, this water reaction? Yeah. Okay. Good question. It's only for water at 25 degrees Celsius. That's right, that's right. That's interesting, that's 10, just a minus 14, like the VH reminds me of pH a little bit. Uh, I wonder if it has something to do with it, or is that VH that concept? Totally where we're going. So hang tight, you bet. Good, cool comment. You're seeing the future. Other questions? All right. So <clears throat> let's say that we have a solution with a hydronium value of 10 to the minus 8th, all right? The question is, what is the hydroxide? Now, you can either do this with me or just watch what I'm going to do. Kw is hydronium times hydroxide, all right? And as long as you know this Kw value, which is really important, 10 to the minus 14, if you have hydronium, like we do in this problem, you can solve for hydroxide, all right? So if Kw is 10 to the minus 14, you divide by 10 to the minus 8, all right? 14 minus 8, basically, with these crazy powers. You end up with 10 to the minus 6 moles per liter. And this is another really cool use of this Kw value because Kw equals hydronium times hydroxide. And as long as you're at room temperature, 25 degrees Celsius or so, hydronium times hydroxide will always be. So <clears throat> this is an example of how you can use this process to your advantage. So let's say that uh, we're in the lab. We add 0 0.0010 moles of sodium hydroxide to a liter of water. And we want to know how much hydronium and hydroxide is present. So sodium hydroxide, is it a base or an acid? Base. Base, that's right. Anything with hydroxide, definitely a base and stuff like that, and this one totally has it. Is it a strong base or a weak base? A strong base. Strong base, right on. What are the three strong bases I want you to know? NaOH, KOH, and probably MgOH2. Uh, lithium hydroxide, that's okay. That is another strong base, but you don't have to know that one. That's class. <laughs> Good question. Yeah, sodium, potassium, lithium, hydroxide, all right? Now, why that's important, if we put 0 0.0010 moles of sodium hydroxide in water, we're gonna end up with 0 0.0010 moles of hydroxide. One-way arrows, no equilibrium, all right? If this was a weak base, we'd have to do different things to it, but not here. So from this information, we can calculate the hydroxide. All right, it's going to be 0 0.0010 divided by a liter. And from there, we can calculate hydronium, all that kind of jazz. So let's go back. <clears throat> the KW expression is two waters as reactants going to hydronium plus hydroxide. <clears throat> now, Le Chatelier's principle, 
which we talked about on Monday, Friday, Friday. Sorry, this is my, sorry. <laughs> oh boy, I'm on the planet Earth. Yes, that's right. Okay, no. The shot latest principle says here we can use it to predict what's going to happen. All right? <clears throat> so normally these two are equal concentrations, and we're adding a lot of hydroxide. So if we add a lot of hydroxide, what's going to happen to this reaction? Will it move to the right? Will it move to the left? Will it stay the same? Left. Nice job. That's right. The Chatelet's principle says, as you add something, it moves to the opposite side. And we are adding a lot of hydroxide. So the hydroxide is going to move this reaction to the left. The hydronium will go down, was 10 to the minus seventh. It's going to be a lot less. <clears throat> so if hydronium was 10 to the minus seventh moles per liter at equilibrium, and it moves to the left, hydronium should be a lot less than 10 to the minus so, questions on that? Okay. So to do this correctly, we should set up the ice table. All right, initial change and equilibrium. Now remember that liquids and solids don't go in your ice tables. We're just going to think about hydronium and hydroxide. <clears throat> Let's assume that hydronium and hydroxide are initially zero, but we're adding in 0 0.0010 divided by one liter 0 0.0010 moles of hydroxide. Now, X, when it's pure water, X would be the 10 to the minus seventh molar value, all right? So we would have had X times X, but with the presence of hydroxide, you've got 0 0.0010 moles per liter. So at equilibrium, you'll still have X moles of hydronium, and you'll have 0 0.0010 plus X moles of hydroxide. Any questions on that? All right. <clears throat> now, KW, 10 to the minus 14th, equals X times 0 0.0010 plus X. Now, in the last chapter, we would have said, all right, X squared plus 0 0.0010 X minus KW equals zero. It would have been a quadratic formula and you can plug it in, solve it, and stuff like that. But we saw earlier that X was 10 to the minus seventh for pure water. And we just said that in the presence of hydroxide, this is going to move that reaction to the left. So what was 10 to the minus seventh is going to be even less than 10 to the minus seventh. So if you have a 10 to the minus 3, which is not a big number, but you add it to an even smaller number, like 10 to the minus 9 or 10 or something like that, this little x is not going to make a difference, all right? It's like what we talked about on Friday. If you have 1,000 minus 1, it's still basically 1,000, all right? 0 0.0010, a small number, plus an even smaller number, and orders of magnitude smaller, not just a little smaller, orders of magnitude smaller, is still going to be 0 0.0010, all right? So if you have the solve button, you can plug this in, hit the solve button, good to go. However, you will save time because even setting up a solve equation in your calculator can take some time. You can pull that little plus x out, all right? It's so small that it doesn't make a difference. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to ignore this little plus x because a number less than 10 to the minus 7 plus 10 to the minus 3 still going to be 10 to the minus 3. Prof hat off. Hey, Hayden's, Hayden's back there going, oh, Russell, he's like trying to make smoke screens and stuff, doing weird juju and stuff like that. Hayden or any of you can still go through the quadratic, I promise. <laughs> all right, no problems there. And with your solve button, that's a lot easier by all means than it used to. You can absolutely still do the full version. But honestly, I don't recommend it because it will make it better. But if you ever doubt, do it, all right? No problem. So, prop that back on. Screw the quadratic. We're going to take out that little plus x. That makes this problem a lot easier because then you have kw equals x times 0 0.0010. 
X is what we're after. That's the hydronium. We already know the hydroxide, 0 0.0010, and that's not going to change. So remembering that Kw is 10 to the minus 14, you divide it by 10 to the minus 3. In the exponent world, 14 minus 3 is how another way to get this 10 to the minus 11. Hydronium, 1.0 times 10 to the minus 11. So what you're seeing in this problem, and what we're going to see from now on, is that you don't always have to do the quadratic. You're welcome to, definitely. But wow, this x is so small compared to this number that you can ignore it. So it basically comes down to Kw divided by this concentration to find the other species. It's a way to get around some of those quadratic formulas. And you don't believe me? You do, still do the quadratic, no problem. But it will save us. Cool. All right, so hydronium, 10 to the minus 11. Hydroxide, 10 to the minus 3. The question is, how do you describe a reaction like this? And hopefully you can see that hydronium 10 to the minus 11 is much, much smaller than hydroxide, which was 10 to the minus 3. So hydroxide is a lot, is a lot bigger of a number than hydronium. A chemist would call this a basic solution, all right? More OH minus than hydroxide. Hydroxide, 10 to the minus 3. Hydronium, 10 to the minus 11. 10 to the minus 3 is greater than 10 to the minus 11, even though they're really small numbers. So that is the definition of what a basic solution is. This is a cheesy little thing from a CD-ROM thing about the pH factor, I think. And uh, I just like the picture on there. So. so a solution is basic if you have more hydroxide than hydronium. Likewise, it would be more acidic if you add more hydronium than you have hydroxide, so. And this leads us into the pH scale, totally. Soren Sorensen was the person that created this scale, and it's very, very useful. It's mostly used for acids and bases, but you can also have like a PCL scale, how much chloride is in your solution. I've seen people use this kind of stuff before. Um, pH is the big one we're going to use, and pH is a direct relationship to the log of the hydronium. It's minus log of the hydronium, technically, to make it a positive number. So if you know what the hydronium, the moles per liter concentration of your, P, of your system is, you can calculate the pH. Now, we saw earlier that at KW, room temperature, uh, hydronium hydroxide, 10 to the minus 7, what is the pH of a neutral solution? Excellent question. pH is going to equal minus log of your hydronium. So minus log of that number, it comes out to be 7, exactly, 7.00. So neutrality in chemistry is defined as having a pH of 7. That doesn't mean you don't have any acid or base. You do. You have both of them. You've got 10 to the minus 7 molar hydronium and 10 to the minus 7 molar hydroxide. But both of those numbers are so small. That's why it's considered to be a neutral value. All right. Um, sometimes plus or minus a little bit. People will use for neutrality. It kind of depends. But technically, pH of 7 is where things are neutral. So. So let's say we go back to the 0 0.0010 molar solution, all right? What's the pH of it, all right? Well, the hydronium is what you need, all right? We don't really need the hydroxide, but we do need the hydronium for the pH. So pH minus log of that number, pH was 11. So when it comes to acids and bases, all right, pH 7 or very, very close to it, that's going to be neutral pHs less than 7 are going to be acidic, and pHs, of course, greater than 7 will be basic. So instead of writing up talk, Clifford and I saying, you know, well, I've got a hydronium concentration of 10 to the minus 11th molar, and you have to think about what that means, he could just say, man, I've got a pH of 11, and I'll go, oh yeah, that's a basic solution, all right? It's that simple. It's just a lot easier to think about it, acids and bases and stuff, so. Now, unfortunately, though, a lot of times the popular media doesn't exactly support this, including my good friend's public enemy. Yeah, boy. 
face. How low can you go? Oh. What a brother no wants to keep that gives the incredible prime animals, the incredible public enemy number one. Now, why I don't like that is base, how low can you go? No, 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 no. Base, how high can you go? Come on, Chuck D, the main person of uh, Public Enemy with Flavor of Flame. Now, come on. Now, Chuck D has an MBA in business, so he doesn't have a lot of science background. I'll give him a pass and stuff. Of, of course, I'm being stupid. But anyway, uh, hopefully that will help you remember that, yeah, base is pH greater than 7, acids pH less than 7. So, my apologies. Questions? So, got a solution. We find it in the lab. We have no idea where it came from, but it says the pH is 10.5. It might be a lame solution, but that's not the right answer here. So, using the value of pH here, what, uh, which one of those and stuff would it be? Would it be acidic, basic, or neutral? Team. Yeah, <laughs> I said it wasn't the lame one, man. It's gonna, it's gonna be basic. It might be lame too, it's hard to say. But the pH itself is the key, of course. pH is greater than seven. So, questions. All right. So most of the things we eat and drink are acidic. That includes what I used to love and drink way too much of, which was Diet Coke. So this is an example of a pH meter. All right. You have a probe that goes into what you're studying and it electronically then translates the uh, basically how much hydrogen's in there uh, into a pH, which is cool. We'll use this something like it in an upcoming lab. So this pH, as you can see, came out to be 3.12. So if you have a pH of 3.12, acidic, basic, or neutral? Acidic. Acidic, that's right. Most of the things we eat and drink are a little bit acidic. How much acid does it have, Dr. Russell? Well, excellent question. pH minus log of hydronium, all right? And here's the pH value. So 3.12 equals minus log of hydronium. Now to solve this, you first have to put the negative on the other side. So negative pH equals log of hydronium. And then like we talked about on Friday, you want to take the anti-log. Now because this is a base 10 log, L-O-G, you want to go 10 to the power of minus pH. 10 to the power of log this, the log and the 10 cancel out, you have just hydronium. And on this side then, you'd have 10 raised to the power of minus pH. So 10 raised to the power of minus 3.12, there's 7.6 times 10 to the minus four moles of hydronium per liter in the Diet Coke, if you choose to drink that. Cool. So, Here's another solution. We'll say it's iced tea, I don't know. Solution has a pH of 4.50, all right? And you wanted to calculate the hydronium concentration. Now, hydronium, once again, is the H3O plus. So you would go 10 raised to the power of minus 4.50 and put that in your calculator and find out. Now, it's gonna be one of these two numbers, all right? Uh, 10 to the minus four is somewhere in there. And if you do this in your calculator, it's 3.2 times 10 to the minus five. But as long as you see how to do it. Um, the concentrations are usually numbers less than one. So if you happen to get a big number, then probably you forgot the minus sign in there, so. Any questions on that? Now, on Friday we talked about this, but I want to talk about it just again real fast. Um, these logarithm problems, which are pH and some things like it, they have some kind of weird sig fig rules. And on Friday, we saw that the number of sig figs are represented to the right of the decimal, basically. So log of 3.07 times 10 to the minus three, this is a three sig fig number. So when you take the log, you would report three numbers to the right of the decimal, all right? Uh, so in this case, it would be minus 2.513. The power, the two right there has to do with the power and stuff like that, and that's all we need to worry about. Um, here's a two sig fig number. So the answer would have two numbers to the right of the decimal, all right? 
On the other hand, here's an anti-log, an anti-base 10 log. Uh, to figure out the number of sig figs, we would look to the number of digits to the right of the decimal. So the 0.12 means two sig figs, 7.6 times 10 to the minus 4. Right. So sometimes it'll look like, you know, whoa, three sig figs to four sig figs, or three sig figs to two sig figs. But when you keep that in the mind, it, there's a meaning to the madness. All right. Did you like to dance? Go to the movie? No. You just want to talk about logarithms, mental stresses, team exchanges, try to look one of them. This is from a really old movie and stuff, but I couldn't resist because all he wants to do is talk about logarithms and heat exchanges. Well, yes, I do, as a matter of fact. But anyway, obviously, I wasn't even cool in the 30s or whatever that movie was. Anyway, uh, so pHs are really useful for things all around us. All right, common substances. There's really cool tables of all the different things. Like I said, most of the things we eat and drink are a little bit acidic. Most of the things we use to clean are basic. All right, so ammonia, oven cleaner, uh, stuff like that. Those are all bases. Um, but again, things we eat are that. Blood is pretty close to seven. All right. Uh, it's a little bit basic. Uh, actually, water from a tap is a little bit less than seven. Uh, carbon dioxide gets in the water and makes carbonic acid. So usually tap water water is a little bit acidic. Um, so quickly, though, you can then tell if something is acidic or basic based on the pH that's given. But there's more you can do with pH than just pH, because pX is always equal to minus log of x. x would usually be some kind of concentration in moles per liter. So, for example, if you had a mysterious, but we'll talk about soon, a mysterious substance K sub A, pKA would be equal to minus log of Ka. This is foreshadowing, yes, we're gonna talk about Ka's in a while. Um, one we will use though that makes sense right now is you can have a pOH scale. So just like pH, the amount of acid equals minus log the amount of acid, pOH is equal to minus log of the hydroxide concentration. And we will be using that here pretty soon too. Now, you have to remember that for a lot of stuff we're gonna do here, KW, 10 to the minus 14th, that's room temperature, all right? So Yusuf decides to do some things on a human body. Human bodies are roughly 37 degrees Celsius. Some of the things we're gonna talk about, he may have to adjust his numbers because 37 and 25 are far enough away, it might affect the KW. So to all of you that might go in one day to studying medical things with human bodies and stuff like that, just realize what we're talking about in this whole class is basically room temperature. And you may have to adjust a little bit to the other systems. Now, if you take the negative log of everything in this expression, all right? So negative log kW, negative log 10 to the minus 14th. <clears throat> negative log of this, you can break them up. And this is one of the cool things about logarithms. So instead of having hydronium times hydroxide, if you take the log of it, you can break them up. So it's minus log hydronium, plus minus log hydroxide. This is one of the cool things you can do with logarithms. Minus log of hydronium is pH, and minus log of hydroxide is pOH. So check this out. If you're at room temperature, 14 equals pH plus pOH. So if you have a pH of four, and you wanna know the pOH, well, 14 minus four, pOH is 10. All right, and that works really well as long as you're at 25 degrees Celsius. We're gonna talk about a pKa pretty soon and a pKb. And I just want you to know that pKa plus pKb also equals 14. And again, we will talk about what pKa and pKb are all about here. But for right now, this 14 equals pH plus pOH is pretty cool. And PK does not stand for the Professional Kickboxing Association. I apologize, not quite that exciting, but the PKs do, do have their own coolness. 
Profit back on. Questions on anything about what kickboxing is all about? Because I have no idea. Yeah. So what's the deal with 14? Cool. 14 comes directly from KW8. So as long as you're at room temperature or pretty close, then KW will apply. And minus log of this number is where the 14 comes from. But Aiden, if you start doing things on Venus, all right, and you're looking at water, maybe KW would be like 1.60 times 10 to the minus 14th. So you'll have a different number here if you're at a different temperature, okay? But if you're at room temperature, which is what most of the planet Earth is, thankfully, well, so far anyway, let me get me started. But anyway, most of the time, this equation works really well. So, so, so pH can be less than zero or more than 14 as long as pH OH is equally far. You bet. Okay. Uh, pH and pOH can definitely exceed the zero to 14 scale, even at room temperature. But if you were at uh, a different planet or something like that, <clears throat> if it would change this number, then you'd have even greater variance. You wouldn't normally see things from just zero to 14. Good question. All right, we'll do more of this on Wednesday. Have a good day. Thank you all for being here. Try to stay dry. <laughs>